Good morning, church. So excited to be here, and we're especially excited to have Lynn and Lissa back with us this morning. Praise God. So happy that you're continuing to get well. So we keep praying for you and super excited that y'all are here. Um, the enemy is all over my family right now, to be fully transparent for various reasons. None of my family is here this morning, um, but that just means that God has something special in store today, and so i um, excited to see what he does with it. i got a lot to cover and a short time to get there, so I'm going to dive right in. Um, we're going to be in Genesis 48 today, so you can go ahead and start turning your Bibles to Genesis 48. <clears throat> it's about the adoption of Ephraim and Manasseh, and it's a beautiful picture of adoption. So... Many of you know the Kissling foster and adoption story, but some of you don't, and most of you don't actually know the whole story. So the adoption story actually started back at the turn of the 20th century. Um, Monica's grandparents, great-grandparents, excuse me, um, were about to get married, and um, the Spanish flu was raging, and Monica's great-grandfather's brother and sister-in-law passed away. And so as a <coughs> wedding gift to themselves, they had, or they adopted the seven children that they had, the, the couple that passed away had. So can you imagine being newly married and having seven kids <laughs> become part of your family? Well, they went on to have five additional, so a total of 12. Um, but in addition to that, Monica's mom and dad fostered a sibling group, a boy and a girl, when she was a child. And um, from the Buckner Baptist Children's Home in Dallas. And so, um, you know, there was a, a legacy there, right? A heritage and legacy there in Monica's side of the family. So she always knew she wanted to do the same. Me? Well, not quite so much. <laughs> we always talked about it. Before we got married even, we talked about it. And it all sounds good, right? Until you get ready to pull the trigger. And then you're like, oh, man, do I really want to do this? Uh, but thankfully, I did. And I was obedient. And God has blessed me beyond measure. So grateful that I did. Um, we were foster parents for more than a decade. Um, we had... Um, Lots of different kids eventually adopted two boys out of that, <clears throat> Toby and Tucker, so uh, a true blessing. So here's what we know about adoption in today's world. Adoption is a deserted doctrine. So church history has done little work in the doctrine of adoption as it relates to the order of salvation. Most Baptist confessions of faith do not include adoption as part of that order of salvation, including the Southern Baptist Convention. And I have notes on this from the past decade. Every sermon I listen to, I take notes on my iPad. And I've been doing that for more than a decade. And so I can easily search the digitized notes. <coughs> I found, search adoption, I found one sermon that mentioned the word adoption significantly enough that I took a note on it. And it was actually Lynn's message from 2021 where he gave us five examples of adoption in the Bible. Thankfully, he didn't, he didn't use Genesis 48. <laughs> so, um, plus for me there. Um, the second thing we know is that adoption is on the rise. Open adoption has made a positive impact on adoption in that it allows birth moms to have some level of relationship with their child, and so they're more, opt you know, they're, they're more, more able to, uh, to do that, to, to, to agree to have the adoption. The pro-life movement has also had a positive impact. Thankfully, folks are aligning their actions with their words and adopting children that they are advocating for uh, to save. The next thing um, that we know about adoption today is, today is that um, there's naive and unrealistic expectations that often lead to disappointment in adoption. There are inevitable, inevitably going to be difficulties in spiritual warfare with adopted children. Newsflash, <laughs> there's going to be spiritual warfare and um, difficulties with your womb children too, right? So Ab and Eve was the first dysfunctional family in the world. And every family since then has been cursed and been dysfunctional. So it it's, doesn't matter. Expect your adopted and your womb children to have issues. Additionally, there are inappropriate fantasies about the gratitude of adopted children. Newsflash, they're going to have an identity crisis. They're going to want to know who their parents are, and they're going to want to know what their family story is. That's normal. Expect it. But don't have unrealistic expectations about gratitude. Also, adopted parents, we have a lot of those in here. <clears throat> you must be prepared for the ignorance and insensitivity of those who you come in contact with. People just don't get it, <clears throat> and they say inappropriate things like, which children are your real children, and which are your adopted children? Which ones are your natural children, and which are not? Which ones are your children, and which are not? Right? How do you think that adopted child feels when they hear the words natural and real and your? <clears throat> we also have frequently got the question, what, what country is Toby from? Our answer is always Ireland. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> 
So theological, the next one, number four, theological illiteracy results in wrong and misguided motives for adoption. We adopt to fill a void in life. Wrong reason. Only God can fill voids in your life. And we have the exact number of womb children that God wants us to have. So don't adopt to fill that void either. We adopt for social justice reasons. Wrong reason. How many times have we heard, that child's going to have such a better life <clears throat> since he's with you, or how lucky they are to be in your home. Or we adopt with a desire to earn God's favor by doing the ultimate good deed, right? You need to be obedient to God and his desires for you, but you cannot earn God's favor. So in summary, maybe God has used a void in your life, or infertility, or desire for social justice, or a desire to do good as a means to have you consider adoption, but it can't be the reason, right? It's okay for those things to make you consider it. And so Monica is aware of what I'm going to say here, but Monica struggled in this space because she really wanted a girl. But God didn't, <coughs> God didn't have that in his plan for us. And so of all the kids that we fostered, we only had one girl, and it was for a couple weeks. And so it took her many, many, many years to accept that God didn't want us to have a girl. So what are my goals today? Number one, I want you to see the significance of this particular adoption in Genesis 48. I want you to see this beautiful picture of Israel adopting his two grandsons, Ephraim and Manasseh. He didn't adopt all of his grandsons. He only adopted these two in particular. And he did it right before he died. So the adoption was not for himself at all. I want you to see the beauty of adoption through the lens of God's adoption of a people for the praise of his glory. God has adopted Israel as a people to the praise of his glory. It's adoption. And I want you to see that beauty. Number three, I want you to see the beauty and significance of your own adoption in Christ. It's only when you understand adoption in general that you can understand the beauty and significance of your own adoption in Christ. Listen to this, Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5. But when the fulfillment of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. If you don't understand adoption, this, this verse might mean something to you, but, but not enough. Number four, I want you to see the beauty of horizontal adoption as an earthly expression of a heavenly reality. I want you to grasp the fact that adopting children here on earth by us is not about us. It's about the reflection horizontally of a vertical reality. It's a painting of a picture of God who is the adopter, and it's painting the picture of us who are the adopted. And we want to understand that portrait, which is greater beauty and meaning in horizontal adoption and a more realistic expectations that come along with it. And then number five, I want you to consider fostering an adoption, the ministry of that. You may never have done so before. I want you to consider it today, perhaps for yourself, perhaps to help someone else. So with all those things, let's look at Genesis 48. Before I read this, I want to clarify the names Jacob and Israel. Most of you know this, but just in case. So Genesis 32, 28 says, And he said, Your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. <clears throat> so God renamed Jacob to Israel, and uh, both names are used in this passage. So for the sake of clarity, I'm going to try to use Israel today, except for when I, I'm quoting scripture, scripture which again um, will interchange the names. All right, so here we go. Genesis 48, let's read it together, and then I'll make some observations, starting in verse 1. Now it came to pass after these things that Joseph was told, Indeed, your father is sick, and he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And Jacob was told, Look, your son Joseph is coming. And Israel strengthened himself and sat up on the bed. Then Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. Verse 4, And he said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you. And I will make you a multitude of people and give this land to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. Verse 5, and now your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt, are mine as Reuben and Simeon. They shall be mine. Your offspring, who you beget, beget after them, shall be yours. They will be called by the name of their brothers in their inheritance. <clears throat> but as for me, when I came to Padan, Rachel died beside me in the land of Canaan on the way, when there was but a little distance to go to Ephrath. I buried her there on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. Verse 8, then Israel saw Joseph's two sons and said, Who are these? And Joseph said to his father, They are my sons, whom God has given me in this place. And he said, Bring them to me, and I will bless them. So let's stop here for a second and note that this adoption is occurring sight unseen, right? He said, Who are these? He doesn't even know who they, who they are. He's never met them before, doesn't know them. Israel didn't say, I saw those two boys and my heart leapt. 
No, he, it's not an emotional decision for Israel to adopt these boys. Let's continue on, verse 10. <clears throat> now the eyes of Israel were dim with age, so that he could not see. And Joseph brought them near, and kissed them, and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I had not thought to see your face, but in fact God has also shown me your offspring. So Joseph brought them from beside his knees, and he bowed down his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand, towards Israel's left hand, and Manasseh with his left hand, towards Israel's right hand, and brought them near. Then Israel stretched out his right hand, and laid it on Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, guiding his hands knowingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. All right, so let's pause here for a second. Understand what's happening. All right, we don't understand the significance of this because we don't live in Bible times. We don't understand the significance of this <clears throat> because we don't understand the symbolism. We don't understand the idea of the son of the right hand, the son of my strength, the blessing of my right hand. So Joseph presents his boys to Israel. He brings them with the oldest in his left hand and the youngest in his right hand because he's facing his father and his father's about to bless him. <clears throat> that way, when, when he brings them, the oldest will be on Israel's right hand and the youngest on his left hand as he's supposed to be. So Joseph knows this and Israel knows this, but Israel knowing what Joseph has done does this. He crosses his hands, right? So he's blessing, he's putting his right hand on the younger boy. According to Joseph, he's doing it the wrong way. We'll see that in a second. So verse 15, and he blessed Joseph and said, God before whom my father Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has fed me all my long, lifelong to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, let my name be named upon them and the, and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Now when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. So he took hold of his father's hand and removed it from Ephraim's head and put it on Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to him, not so, father, my father, for this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, son, I know. He also shall became a, become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly, your younger brother shall be greater than he, and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. So he blessed them that day, saying, By Israel will bless, saying, By you, Israel, will bless, saying, My God made you as Ephraim and Manasseh, and thus set Ephraim before Manasseh. Then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I am dying. But God will be with you and bring you back to the land of my fathers. Moreover, I have given to you one portion of my, uh, above your brothers, which I took from the hand of the Amorite by sword and bow. All right, so Genesis 48 is a beautiful picture of adoption. Um, and there are several truths that I want you to understand about vertical, adop vertical adoption and horizontal adoption to accomplish those goals that I set out earlier. We are vertically adopted to our horizontal father, or vertically adopted to our father, in Christ, and we adopt horizontally on earth as an expression of our heavenly reality. So on each of these points, I want to show you how this occurs in the text. I want to make the connection to the theological truth in the new covenant, and I want to connect, uh, make the connection to today and um, horizontal adoption. So the first truth, Israel gave the birthright to Ephraim and Manasseh. <clears throat> so Israel gave the birthright to Joseph by adopting Ephraim and Manasseh as the status of firstborn son. They were not second class citizens. They became tribes, the tribe of Ephraim and the tribe of Manasseh. Genesis 48, five, and now your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt are mine as Reuben and Simeon. They shall be mine. They will not be slighted in any way. They are not treated as second-class citizens. All right, so let's look at the lineage of, of Abraham. Um, on the far right, you can see uh, Manasseh and Ephraim uh, in the dark green boxes. Uh, they are descendants of Joseph, obviously Joseph's first and second born. Joseph, you can see in that column, is um, the 11th son of Abraham. Um, Reuben and Simeon are the top two, one and two. And so Manasseh and Ephraim have the same birthrights as Reuben and Simeon. Right, so they're not to be slighted in any way. The other thing I want to point out here that we'll talk about in a minute is um, Israel is the son of Isaac, is the son of Abraham, and, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Well, let's continue on. John 1, 12 and 13 says, As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born, not of blood, nor of will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but God. That is adoption, right? We are children of God. I am a child of God. 
Charles Spurgeon's quote from The Spirit and the Cry Sermon says, Adoption gives us rights of children. Regeneration gives us the nature of children. We are partakers of both of these, for we are sons. We have the nature of children. We have the rights of children. We belong to the house of God, the household of God. I am adopted. He is our father. We are his children. I am a child of God. He doesn't merely rescue us from, from hell. Right? He adopts us. Please get this. He adopts us. J.I. Packer gets it right in his classic Knowing God. Our understanding of Christianity cannot be better than our grasp of adoption. So we must get rid of this idea of the universal fatherhood of God and the universal brotherhood of man. We are not all God's children. Right? If we were all God's children, adoption into God's family would mean nothing. Right? We are objects of God's wrath. What Paul says in Ephesians 2, we are by nature objects of his wrath, and we must be adopted into his family to become objects of his love. Not all my brothers, or not all men are my brothers, but those who are bought by the blood of the Lamb are my brothers in every sense of the word. I am a child of God. We are sons and we are daughters of the Most High. And in horizontal adoption, we don't understand this reality, and we must. All right, so let me tie it back to inappropriate questions that are asked of adoptive parents. Which ones are your real children? They don't understand adoption, right? It's bigger than biology. We have an overblown appreciation for our own biology. Blood may be thicker than water, but not adoption. This is bigger than biology. The second truth is <clears throat> their inheritance was based on the promise of God. The inheritance of, the inheritance of Ephraim and Manasseh were based on the promise of God, not the possessions of Israel. He didn't give them a special coat, right? Genesis 48, 2 through 5 says that Jacob was told, Look, your son Joseph is coming to you, and Israel strengthened himself and set on the bed. Then J Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at lust in the land of Canaan and blessed me. And he said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will make you a multitude of people. And giving this land to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. You now, and now your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt, are mine, as Reuben and Simeon shall be mine. Notice what he connects it to, the promise of God, right? Jacob recounted God's promise of the blessing of the numerous people and the everlasting possession of the land. It's not about, it's not about Israel's enjoyment. He's on his deathbed, right? Jo Jacob, this is not about Israel's fulfillment. This is about passing on of an inheritance. Theologically, listen to this, Romans 8, 15 through 17. For you do not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption of sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness to our spirit that you are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also glorify with all that is his is ours, including his suffering. The heavenly possession, that's what he gives. That's why adoption is important. Why do I have security in my salvation? Because I inherited it as an adopted son. It's my inheritance. Today, we view this, how do we view this horizontally? We must not look at adopted children as an inheritance to us. It's not about us, right? We must look at adopted children as an inheritance Christ. We must adopt children with a view towards raising them in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, with a view towards Christ. Having full inheritance, my son, the only thing of worth of which I possess is the promises to me by God. So here's the gospel. My desire for you is to belong to him because it's the most important thing that I have to give you. All right, the third truth, Israel adopted out of love. Their ambition was based on the love that the father Israel had for the son Joseph, not anything that Ephraim or Manasseh had done. Our adoption is based on the love the father has for the son. It's not about you and me. It's about Christ. Listen to Genesis 48, 8, and 9. Then Israel saw Joseph's sons and said, Who are these? And Joseph said to his father, They are my sons, whom God has given me in this place. And he said, Please bring them to me, and I will bless them. Who are these? Israel doesn't even know them, because it's not about them. It's about the love that he has for Joseph. Israel adopted these boys as a blessing to Joseph. So listen to Ephesians 1, 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. I am beloved. And adopting a child has to do with my love for Christ. That's why we do this horizontally. We adopt children for his glory, for his honor, 
and for his namesake. It is for Christ. The fourth truth is adoption is about kingdom expansion. Israel adopted Ephraim and Manasseh with the view towards kingdom expansion. Look at Genesis 48, 15, and 16. And he blessed Joseph and said, God before, before whom my father Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who he fed me all my life long to this day, the angel who he redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, let my name be named upon them in the names of my father Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. He says, me, my father Isaac, my father Abraham. Notice that he doesn't go back any further than that. Why? Because it's not about his earthly family. Right? It's about the covenant promises of God. He goes back to Abraham because he's going back to the covenant. God has made a promise, and may those two boys flourish in the context of that promise. Look at Romans 8, 28 and 29. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to conform to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That's the goal. That's the goal. And in horizontal adoption, this happens in two ways, right? Horizontal adoption is an incredible opportunity to proclaim the gospel. Well, Brad, why did you adopt that child? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> because it's a horizontal expression of a vertical reality that drives who we are. We are adopted by our Heavenly Father in Christ. And through that horizontal adoption, we are extending and expressing that spirit of adoption to those children, right? We adopt because we are adopted. Christ laid his life down. He took it up again that we might become children of God, that we might inherit, in, in, inherit the promises. And we do this horizontal adoption for the same reality. It's an opportunity to preach the gospel. The second way is horizontal adoption as a captive audience, right? An adopted child comes into your home. I don't know if he's going to be tall, short, fat, thin, smart. I don't know any of those things. But I do know you'll get preached to. He's going to hear the gospel and in large doses. So number five, the promise isn't based on birth order or biology, right? Israel continued the tradition of blessing the younger versus the older, thus demonstrating the reality that the promise is not based on birth order or biology, but on calling and election. Joseph does what he's supposed to do, and he puts the kids in the proper order. The older one on the right, the younger one on the left. But Israel crosses his arm, right? And Joseph is just undone over that. Genesis 48, 14, then Israel stretched out his right hand, and he laid it on Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and he put his left hand on Manasseh's head, guiding his hands knowingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. Israel's making... The point that it isn't about birth order or even about biology. It's about calling an election. All right, so as the praise team comes up, <clears throat> this, this is a beautiful picture of adoption. And this is bigger than you and me, right? I'll go back to where we started. So let me restate my goals. I wanted you to see the significance of this adoption here in Genesis 48. I hope you've seen that significance in this adoption of Ephraim and Manasseh. I wanted you to see the beauty of adoption through the lens of of God's adoption of a people to the praise of his glory. And I hope you've seen that today. I wanted you to see the beauty and significance of your own adoption in Christ. <clears throat> I hope you've seen that today. I wanted you to see the beauty of horizontal adoption as an earthly expression of a heavenly reality. I pray that you've grasped that today. And I want you to consider the ministry of fostering and adoption. And I pray that you do that today. There are some of you in this room who God would have adopted a child. And you might be from all earthly accounts, the least likely person. Wouldn't that just be like God? There are others of you in this room whom God would call to partner with families and organizations who support foster and adoption. But here's what I know. There are millions of kids who, in their current environment, will never hear the glories of Christ, and I want them to. Millions of babies who will not know how sweet his name is. I know how I want them to, and I know all of you who are believers that know him want them to as well. Again, this is a beautiful picture of adoption. Um, and it's about so much more than a family finally being able to have a child. It's about Christ, his kingdom, and its expansion. Let us glorify the king, for I am adopted, I am beloved. It's my inheritance, and I'm a child of God.